Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Mercatus Podcast, Digital Grocer, episode 33. I'm your host, Sylvain Perrier, president and CEO of Mercatus Technologies. And as always, joining me in the studio today is Mark Fairhurst, our senior director of marketing. Hello, everyone. Mark, it's a beautiful day in Toronto, but I will tell you, and I think you've noticed because mm-hmm. you drove in, yep. it's unfortunately eerily quiet. Yeah, middle of the week, and it is like a Sunday morning. Mm-hmm. It is. Very early. And it's not only quiet out in the street, it's mm-hmm. actually very quiet in the Mercatus office. That's right. And why? We are in a work from home mode. We are. And uh, unfortunately, we are being plagued with coronavirus or more commonly known as COVID-19. Correct. So this disease is gripping our nation. It has a hold of mankind and our financial markets and the markets are tanking. New York State and the province of Ontario are actually, surprisingly enough, and this is where it gets really scary, in a state of emergency. Mm -hmm. Mark, have you ever been to New Rochelle? No, I haven't. No. What beautiful place. But unfortunately, it's also under quarantine. And San Francisco, and you and I have been talking about this, has decreed shelter in place. And some other cities may actually do the other, the same thing. Uh, There's talk about New York. Mm -hmm. De Blasio, the mayor, uh, was wanting to instate the shelter in place. But... Governor Cuomo has said no effing way. Mm-hmm. And there's talk about LA. I wouldn't be surprised if that's not something our mayor here would want to consider doing, considering it's actually one of Canada's uh, largest city. There's also an international travel ban. It's heavily restricting travel between, you know, US and Europe, Canada, Europe, and even more importantly, most people actually probably don't mm-hmm. know this, the longest undefended border on the planet between our two countries between our two countries and now it's being restricted to only uh, commercial trade yeah it's unprecedented that's for sure yeah and then we're seeing untold number of financial release solutions or being injected into the market to calm nerves and to create some form of stability now for the most part we are in uncharted territory unless you've gone through parts of 9-11 SARS, Mm -hmm. H1N1, MERS, and kind of some of the other types of, you know, unfortunate issues that have hit mankind. You really may not know how to deal with this. This is on a scale, and not many people who would be listening to this podcast would remember this. This is the Spanish flu of 1918, 1919. A hundred percent. And that's why it's affecting the entire planet, Yeah, which is... (sighs) For me, it it didn't really start sinking in, to be honest with you. Last week, I was traveling into the U.S., and I drove multiple existing clients and prospective clients to visit. And I decided to drive. Kevin Kidder, director of uh, product, was with me, Mm -hmm. and Tim Zimmerman, one of our sales executives, was also with us. And it got really real Wednesday, Wednesday night. The reason it got real Wednesday night I was in a rental. I had CNN playing and you could hear just a lack of accountability in the White House. And this is not a political show in any case, but you could hear the lack of preparedness. You could equally get that from our own prime minister here in Canada in terms of the lack of preparedness. I think we were seeing more activity at the provincial level. And I have to actually comment the premier of, uh, the French province in Canada, Quebec, they've been stellar in their response Mm -hmm. out to the public. And I saw Tim for five minutes Wednesday night. His wife, who is a vice president for a large marketing firm in Minneapolis, she was visiting clients in the Canary Islands. And I think it's the Minister of Tourism. Mm -hmm. And she flew in through Spain, was flying out through Spain. And during the White House press briefing, and I was talking to you from the car around nine o'clock Wednesday night. Yep. Yeah, I remember. And remember how the president kind of said they are literally shutting down the border for people coming in from Europe. Mm-hmm. And he neglected to say, with the exception of, well, Tim calls, hey, I'm trying to rush my wife back into the country, trying to get a flight. It's a zoo. Delta's not helping. I can't get through to them. Yada, yada. I said, well, hold on, Tim. She's okay. She's a U.S. citizen. She's fine. Like He's like, where are you getting this? I was listening to the president talking. I said, no, the State Department had to really 
clarify the rules. Yeah, clarify yeah. the yeah. rules. And there was, you know, do I want to say the response to this whole issue has been botched? Yeah, I do. And I think when we were at NGA, mm -hmm. you know, that's where this the heightened sensitivity of COVID nineteen really came into play. Yeah, yeah. We and were talking on the way down. On the way down, and you yeah. came back on the flight the day before me. Right. Flight attendants were wearing gloves. Yeah. I yeah. think they had masks on. Yeah. There were people on the plane wearing masks. Were you wearing your mask? I was not myself. No, I felt pretty secure in the people that were around me. Right. But I know a colleague of ours, uh, Kevin. Actually, mm -hmm. he felt very uncomfortable well there were people around him that were sick yeah yeah they were sick i wore my mask the next day on the plane people look at you and you know does the mask really help yes and no if it's an n95 mask to a certain extent i think it protects more people from you versus the opposite That's correct but i didn't know whatever i can do to kind of create this safety bubble around me so a lot of it's psychological right? too going back to your point mm. i think this caught a lot of the senior leaders in both countries off guard which is surprising considering the amount of lead time they've had based on the, you know, the results January. from, from uh, Wuhan and China. January. Yeah. That's the lead time that we yeah. had. So COVID-19 is having an interesting impact. Some positive, some negative mm -hmm. on the retail industry. And considering the nature of our podcast, and Mark, you know this better than I, I thought it would be, and we, we've been pondering, mm -hmm. deciding if we should record this episode, mm -hmm. a lot of value to our listeners to kind of assemble some information from some trusted sources whether it be Barclays, Nielsen, the CDC, the WHO, yep. people decided to call the who. Yeah. For some, for some, why do we always, <laughs> humanity is this way of dumbing down words now, like the who, like who is the who? The who is a band, it's a rock band. It's not the World Health Organization. You know who leads the who? No, it's what's Dr. his name? Doctor Who. <laughs> is it really? No. Okay, no, I was like, <laughs> wow, this, this guy's taking his job way too seriously. And we figured we'd share some of our observations, more specifically what's happening in industry, what is a short-term, potentially long-term impact, and things that we've learned as a digital e-commerce platform provider out in the industry. And I will tell you that that moment from that Wednesday to the Friday to the Saturday, <laughs> it, mm -hmm. it was, whoa. And this is, whoa, as not who, but it was amazing seeing our senior leaders in our business, our processes, and really culminate in a way that we could not only support our clients in industry at the moment, but even today. And the fact that, you know, we had already made the provisions back in December. I remember this, you know, at Mercatus, we have a senior leadership meeting once a week. Yeah. It's an hour and a half. We talk about governance, strategy, risks, mm -hmm. uh, and people. HR had raised the issue fairly early on towards the end of December, right through the in early new year that this COVID-19, we needed to be ready. So we had already gone ahead and updated our, our work from home policy. And we immediately were starting to notify our team. And we made the call the Thursday night at 7.30 yep. that we'd be advising our team the following day at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time that you were going to be working from home. 92 people working from home. Luckily, we have the infrastructure, we have the processes, we have the back office technology to do this. And it's been it's been wonderful. I think some of the challenges we're seeing when you do this as a business is the culture. And we have a culture that's very, um, how would I say this? What's the right word? Like, you know. I think it, everyone feeds off everyone else. Yeah, physical. The, the energy and, yeah. and, and the being in the same physical space. Yeah, physical presence is yeah. really key to the ignition behind our culture. And I think that and you combine the lack of that and you're when you're confined and you're trying to do some form of social social separation mm -hmm. that becomes a challenge so let's just jump into it so the first is a disclaimer we're not disease experts nope at all i'm not a doctor i don't think you are not when I last checked, no. Yeah, no. Okay. Okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> Suddenly he checks tomorrow morning and he's a doctor. There are, there are online courses. There are, yes. I. Yes. You know what the one online course I've always wanted to take was to be either become a pastor or someone that marries people. Awesome. No, and the only reason I said that because I watched that Friends episode where Joey marries Monica and Chandler. Oh, yes. 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 I'm like, hey. You, that you want to do that? Yeah, but that doesn't work here in Canada. No. So, yeah, it's unfortunate. In any case, I also do not want to be a notary. So I don't know who does. So Mark, I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay. So, but in part of my disclaimer, let me backtrack a little bit. 
The best sources are if you're in Canada, mm-hmm. Health Canada, as always. Public Health Agency of Canada. Yeah. Yep. And then there's in the U.S., the CDC. Yep. And WHO. That's correct. Right. Those are the, the really the most factual three sources of on COVID-19, coronavirus that you will find. Not the media. Yep. Not Fox News, not CNN, not your local affiliate, not the BBC, not ESPN. Yep. I'm not clear. ESPN is not reporting on coronavirus, but really not those sources. Go to those ones, those three that we mentioned. So, Mark, what is COVID-19? It is a virulent, uh, contagious respiratory disease. Oh, wow, that's really, actually that's not that bad. Oh, okay. So COVID nineteen is a severe acute respiratory mm-hmm. syndrome, mm-hmm. SARS, coronavirus, or it's more in the scientific community. It's also known as SARS dash CoV C O V dash two, and it's actually in. We decided to call it well, not we as in you and I. Uh, the community decided to call it COVID nineteen, and it belongs to a broad family of viruses known as coronavirus now other coronaviruses are actually capable of causing certain types of illnesses as simple as the common cold to something actually more severe much like do you remember mers yep yep yeah well, i i lived through sars you, i mean yeah you did too. in 03 yeah yeah in 03 and because uh, toronto was sort of like a the north american epicenter yeah. for it that was 03 12 was mers which yep. is the middle east respiratory syndrome mm-hmm. A lot worse than SARS in terms of its death rate. Yeah. We didn't necessarily get it here in Canada or in Toronto per se. I remember, I remember in 03 when SARS hit, our medical infrastructure and systems here was completely unprepared. I think we're in better stead now because of the lessons mm-hmm. our public health community learned as yeah. a result of SARS. What well, they did. Yeah. Absolutely. Remember that concert that we had at the end? Oh, uh, with the Rolling Stones? Rolling Stones. Yeah. ACDC. Yeah. Justin Bieber made his big appearance at SARS Talk, and the fans were lost it on him. ACDC had to come out to calm the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, I, always, I suggest you guys Google that. Okay, so now we know a little bit about what is COVID-19 or the coronavirus. So why the word coronavirus? Is that because of the shape of the virus itself? Damn, you're brilliant. Am I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the word Corona doesn't come from the beer. Uh, that was my second guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel really bad for the, the brand managers at Corona. So the word was actually introduced by a group of virologists in a, this really short article titled Coronavirus in News and Views section of Nature in this really big book that was published back in November of 1968. And so these guys kind of exclaims that the characteristic of the fringe of the virus they were looking at through a microscope was rounded or petal shaped rather than sharp or pointed Mm -hmm. compared to some of the other viruses that they were looking at. And it had the appearance, as you so well Mm -hmm. said, of the solar corona. Mm -hmm. And so from that point forward, the name was used and carried on through for that specific class of viruses. So coronavirus in one word, it's not two words, it's one word. So what are the symptoms of COVID-19? It's very much like the flu. Yeah. I understand. Uh, Yeah. Aches, pains, fever, Mm -hmm. cough, obviously. Yeah. And I know it takes about five days for the symptoms to really come on. Yeah, 2 to 14. Yeah. So you're bang on on those symptoms. And, you know, in some cases, you'll see muscle pain, mucus Mm -hmm. production, and some sore throats. Yeah. But again, that's that's very uncommon. And majority of the case results are mild. But it can progress to be severe severe pneumonia, Mm. and in some cases, multi-organ failure. That's scary. The heart and the lungs, right? So who's more at risk to contracting COVID-19? I think the older segment of the population. Yeah. So Yeah, so everyone's at risk. Mm -hmm. But who is really, truly exposed here are people with pre-existing conditions, including hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, any anyone that's really taking some sort of immunosuppression medication, they are at risk. And they're, they're kind of saying the stats are really weird. Again, you're not necessarily seeing between the CDC, WHO, and Health Canada, they're not exactly saying, well, it's people over the age of 60. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, you know, it's people over the age of 80. It doesn't really matter. It's 
those types of individuals that are taking these types of medications or have these side conditions. My next question is, how is it spread? Well, I know so the new term, social distancing, mm-hmm. you have to keep a certain distance from those around you through cough, sneeze, I guess, any droplets that are mm-hmm. in the air. Mm-hmm. And you can actually pick it up from materials, plastics, metals, yeah, fabrics. And I think the life expectancy of the virus varies it depending does. on the material. Yeah, it does. So... You're bang on in terms of respiratory droplets yeah. that are passed through sneezing or coughing, mm-hmm. uh, typically in someone that it's normally within six feet of you. Hence why we're saying social distancing should be six feet or greater. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of survivability of COVID-19 on a surface, whether it's plastic, metal, or material, can vary from an hour to three days. It really, insane, depend- yeah. it really depends on the environment. Yeah. I'm going to assume the more humid it is out, the longer this stuff mucus doesn't necessarily dry out, right? Well, you think about it, I mean, Australia is just entering their, coming out of their summer. That's right. Right. And their cases are spiking just as much as anywhere else. Well, Tom Hanks and his wife. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They're there filming a movie. I think that's what really brought it home to a lot of people. I mean, it's... When Tom, when I remember listening to CNN when they said Tom Hanks has it. Yeah. It's like America's dad is... America's dad. Is like Mr. Rogers has COVID nineteen. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Yeah. Rogers is going to die. Yeah, no, he's not. And I know he's not. Well, isn't he already dead? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Rogers is yes. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, well, not good, but I'm just like, just actually, I figured he's already dead. Now, when you touch, or if you get some of these droplets mm-hmm. on you, or mm-hmm. you touch one of these surfaces, uh, surfaces with the virus. What really causes it to spread or you getting it, you're putting your finger in your nose and your mouth or possibly in your eyes. On average in an hour, how many times does a person touch their face? I don't know. I think it's between 20 and 30 times. Oh my God. On average. Wow. When we were on a conference call, I was taking screenshots of some of our colleagues. saying They were touching their eyes. They're t- yeah, they're touching their face. Well, it wasn't in their nose. No. So what are the timelines of this discovery of this COVID-19? What are the timelines? Yeah. When was it discovered? Was it uh, November? Yeah. November, December. Yeah. It depends. So within the community of medical experts in China, it would have been November, December, considerably later until the country, China admitted yeah. they're having this issue. And it wasn't declared a pandemic until March 11th, 2020. And in now, today, we're recording this episode on the 19th of March. Mm-hmm. The number of the cases in the United States, I think, is it over 8,500 now? Jump by you're right. 40%. It's in the, going up. Well, testing is catching sig- significantly. up. Significantly. Significantly, yeah. right? How is COVID-19 treated? Uh, inhalers, respiratory, ventilation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, so there's currently no FDA-approved medication for COVID-19. Now, so people infected with this virus, they receive supportive care. Right. So typically what you would do if you had the flu, mm-hmm. rest, fluids, fever control. And I also heard that you should be taking Tylenol. Like you should not be taking what's, ibuprofen. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You should be taking what's what's Advil made of. I think that's um, the other one. There's ibuprofen and uh, psilocybin acid. I think ASA. something like that. Yeah. 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 So Tylenol is the better choice here mm-hmm. to kind of help relieve some of the symptoms. Now for severe cases. Treatment has to include care to support your vital organs. That's why there's there continues to be conversations that we may or may not have enough respirators mm-hmm. in industry. Yeah. And, you know, Elon Musk mm-hmm. has kind of gone out and, t- and said, hey, guess what? Um, if we do run out of respirators, we're happy to kind of jump in as a, as a manufacturer here and start building those out. Well, I know. I think it was today that the, the president had signed into and to order the defense contracting yeah. act basically government telling industry you need to produce this well it's commandeering lines yeah, yeah. right which yeah. hasn't been done since just before uh, the korean war yeah which is i think is a wonderful thing to do yeah we're seeing cpgs right now jump in you know i don't know if you saw this but jameson in ireland suspending one of their lines and they're going to be manufacturing hand sanitizer. Yeah, that's the distillery. The distillery, yeah, which I think is great. Governor Cuomo decided to act for New York to manufacture its own brand of hand sanitizer and so on, right? And you see a lot of people trying to build those, you know, 
make your own at home. But mm. the reality is it has to be above 60% alcohol. So what should we be doing to protect ourselves? Staying home, mm -hmm. staying away. I mean, if you're sick, do not go out into community. Right. Always wash your hands. Mm -hmm. Don't touch your face. Don't touch your face. And stay away from the elderly. Oh, that's tough. Especially, yeah. especially well, you know, you it, know your mom. Yeah, my mom's in a long-term care facility. Yeah. And we talked to her last night, but she has no idea this was going on. You can't go and visit. No. No, it's a lockdown, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, same with my in-laws. I mean, they can't go out. We're actually ordering stuff for them. Where they live, they don't have e-commerce for grocery, quite mm -hmm. frankly. So, But luckily, UPS delivers for Amazon. So we're buying stuff for them online. Oh, great. So wash your hands. Avoid touching your eyes, your nose, your mouth. When you wash your hands, use soap and water for at least 15 to 20 seconds. <laughs> I love it. The CDC has a video how to wash your hands. Thank you to the CDC. If soap and water are not available, use hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. and it has to be at least 60% alcohol. Cover your coughs, yep. your sneezes with a tissue, and don't throw, then throw the tissue in the trash. I thought it was going to suggest to throw it in an incinerator. <laughs> Make sure for your household cleaners that you're using at home that they are the ones that are recommended by the CDC. Think Lysol, Clorox, mm -hmm. and they have if, that. If, if you can find them in on the shelves. If you can find them. Yeah. Yes. Hoarding. We got to talk about hoarding. Yeah. That is actually a psychological thing. It is. Uh, yeah, it is. We'll get to it. If you haven't gotten the flu yet and you don't get vaccinated, go ahead and get that vaccine for the flu. And I'm sorry to the anti-vaxxers out there, but uh, this is a matter of life and death. Well, it, it's community. Yeah. Health, life and death. It's the health of the population at large. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So how is this affecting the retail industry? That's what we're here to, <laughs> to, to, to really talk about. But yeah. So for those of you, let's, let's just jump into it, right? Yeah. So for those of you that have may have gone through 9-11, right? So when the two planes hit the Twin Towers, the Twin Towers went down and then there was the incident in the middle of Pennsylvania with the plane coming down and then there was the uh, Pentagon, uh, the Pentagon yeah, yeah. right? It was a moment of revelation for us because we had a very clear enemy. In this case here, you can't easily point, can't point to a virus. Mm -hmm. But the commonality between 9-11 and now is this, what is being called nesting, mm -hmm. right? So people lining up to go to grocery stores, buying toilet paper, buying paper products and so on. They're nesting. So the effect for grocery retail is kind of interesting because sales are skyrocketing. Gross revenue will be just through the roof. What we saw here at Mercatus on Wednesday, soon after President Trump speech to the nation, which was around nine o'clock Eastern, yep. uh, Eastern Standard Time, we went from a baseline usage to think it was two to three X traffic immediately coast to coast, mm -hmm. both in Canada yep. and the United States on the Thursday when the markets opened and the market started to tank and, you know, financial institutions are talking about concerns about liquidity in the market. We saw a run up compared to our baseline of six X. Now, for us, that's easy to handle from a technology perspective because the way that we've designed our infrastructure, the way that we've designed the architecture of our technology, where we host, and the fact that we have a modern IT team called DevOps mm -hmm. that are both operators and developers, we're able to auto scale. But we actually immediately had to implement 24 hour shift work. We had to increase, we use, we are, we're fully instrumented, Mark. So we're using tools like New Relic mm -hmm. to tell us, hey, if something's happening, the health of the server, the CPU consumption, memory consumption, and so on, we'll set off alarms. We immediately had to start, and we typically can auto scale a server in under five minutes. We actually had to preventively manually auto scale just to handle the load, which is insane. Explain that. So what's the difference between automated and manual process? Yeah. Well, so if you're not doing that manually where you're saying, hey, when I reach, this is an example, mm -hmm. but let's say I have 
a master-slave configuration on my database server. And you'll have one master and multiple slaves. And means you're distributing the load of read and writes across those servers. And so you may set thresholds in your instrumentation to say, if I hit 60% of connections to my master server, or if I'm consuming 80% of my available memory, sound an alarm and go ahead and spin up another server, mm -hmm. auto-replicate the database. Gotcha. That's automated. So it happens before you are in a moment of crisis. If you don't have that technology, no, we've seen a lot of Canadian, very, very large Canadian retailers and some U.S. retailers, quite frankly, where they could not service their clients. The website went went completely dark and likely because they host their own infrastructure, it hasn't been designed and they're not using a virtual infrastructure, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So they haven't virtualized their operating systems and so on, their containers as they're called. And so when you're at peak 100% and you have to go spin up another server, you have to do that manually. You have to provision it. Then you have to copy data over to it. You're introducing a human into something where you don't. That gotcha, becomes that gotcha. becomes a challenge. It's, right? a, it's a risk. It, well, it's a massive yeah, risk yeah. because you're under pressure as an individual. You need to do this. You may miss a step. You get somebody breathing down your neck. You're losing money. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say this is where it got really crazy. On the Friday, we went up 20x to baseline. From the baseline. From the baseline. On Wednesday. By the Friday. Okay. By but, the Friday. But between Wednesday and Friday. Uh, we went 6, 12, overnight 16. That's By the insane. Friday, we were 20x. That's insane. Yeah. And we're today, we're consistently maintaining 2 to 3x what would be normal baseline. Right. right. The cause and effect on our retailers, though... Those that do click and collect was labor shortage, mm -hmm. supply chain issues. Right. On the delivery side, and we don't do delivery at Mercatus, we partner with multiple delivery partners, mm -hmm. was the lack of availability of gig economy workers. Mm -hmm. And that's rampant industry wide, regardless who the provider is. And this is a challenge for the gig economy today. I mean, we're not even talking about this in this show, but no. it's, it's another show in itself. It's another show in yourself. But yeah. like, if you have a choice of being healthy and alive and you don't have healthcare, yep. that becomes a problem. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is, is expose yourself to the risk. Yeah. And the additional volume of sales that is coming back into grocery e-commerce or grocery sales in general, you have to consider grocery in this world as an essential service, Right. You know, versus a Best Buy or versus a, you know, do you really well, need to go buy a camcorder? No, but. Well, we know what's happened in Italy. I mean, the entire right. country is on lockdown. It's on lockdown. And the only retailers that are open are those that do for groceries. Right. And pharmacy. That's right. That's right. In fact, now the new reality, when you think of grocery retail it's we're not far from deeming it an essential service mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and probably along with the internet. So retailers immediately are being bombarded by an additional series of transactions, both online and in store, right. because people are trading out of restaurant. Restaurants are closed. Social distancing. Yeah. And the same effect if, you know, bars. And so people are not going to go hang out at the bar at 430 to hit happy hour. So they're going to the grocery store. So it's the shift buying purchases from food away from home to that's food right. at home. A hundred percent. So that's going to be great for their top line. Mm -hmm. But we're not sure of how much of those dollars will flow through to the bottom simply because the cost of having to bring in more labor. Mm -hmm. And we know at least I received at least 12 emails from different retailers across the United States looking to hire Frontline staff, cleaning staff, staff to stock the shelf, staff to do work at the distribution center and so on. So that's going to have a knock on effect on margin. Yeah. There is a risk that this also may cause some sort of food inflation, mm -hmm. meaning that the cost to, because of the excess demand, the cost to produce, the cost to build up prices may go up. It's basic law of economics, supply and demand. Supply and demand. Yeah. Now, this is where it gets a little trickier. And what we saw in 08, 09, 
I think we recorded a previous show where we talked about what if we got hit with another recession. Correct. Right? Correct. With the retailers that did not properly bounce back out of 0809 suffer if they were ever put in a position where there's a lack of liquidity in the market, lack of access to trade and co-op, and so on and so on mm-hmm. and so on. Mm-hmm. So this is where it gets where I think it's going to get close to 0809. Let's say we get out of this. Well, let's, yeah, we hope we do. We yes. hope we do. And yeah. it, will it take two weeks, three weeks, six weeks, eight months? I'm hearing it's, I'm hearing numbers as I, high as 18 yeah, months. Yeah, I think it could take, following other pandemics, you know there's going to be a second spike. Absolutely. And they're estimating in the October, November time frame. Yeah. And so I think if I'm at the government right now or the World Health Organization is, what we call about flattening that proverbial curve. Mm-hmm which is really minimizing the impact on the healthcare system. You know, if you look at New York and Cuomo has been transparent with his Mm -hmm. numbers, he has 56,000 hospital beds and then plus urgent care, blah, 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 all those things. If you used to look at the percentage of people that may get hit, take a percentage of the people that may get hit that may need to be in the hospital and the ones that need to be on on the ventilator, there's not enough beds, there's not enough ventilators. (laughs) Yep. So we talk about flattening the curve, and this is why we close bars, restaurants, social distancing, send people to work from home, and enact our BCPs, right? At some point, we're going to get out of this. We don't know when. The WHO is probably trying to figure out, well, how big will the second wave be? Can we relax the rules at that point? Regardless of when that is, people have overbought. <laughs> You got, you got food in your pantry. You got food in your basement. There's going to be a certainly a, a letdown. Following There's going this. to be a letdown. Yeah. And what you're going to see come out of that is rapid trading out of the channel. Back, we saw the reverse in 08, 09. People trading out of restaurants back into grocery, down from a really high-end grocer, down into a lower EDLP, yep. EDLP yep. right? And from, <clears throat> I hate to say it, if you couldn't afford an EDLP, you went into dollar store. Mm-hmm. If you couldn't afford a dollar store, you were into a food bank. Yep. Yep. But so the effect here with similar to 0809, people will trade right out of grocery. They'll go back to fast food. They'll go back to their higher end quick serve restaurant, so on and so on and so on. And, and, so and, on. and you're going to have a fast food or a, a food service industry that's going to be yeah. desperate to attract that consumer dollar. Right. What we don't know is where does trading co-op fall into this? I know that some retailers have suspended printing their flyers, Mm -hmm. right? On average, flyer production is 50% of a marketing budget. There's some retailers right now we're leading up to Easter. I haven't seen any promotional activity in some stores that I've been to, and I've visited quite a few stores in the greater Toronto area where they are not activating some of their promotions because it's like, let's just get stuff on the shelves at this point. The reality is FMI has always talked about that at some point, X percent of people in the United States will be using e-commerce by 2025. It will represent, I think the number was, was it a hundred billion? I can't remember. A hundred billion. Yep. It's something like that. And in Canada, it's considerably lower. Yep. I think we probably we're going to hit, get to that number much sooner. Basically, um, e-commerce was on fire, but this right. is like an accelerant. Oh my God! Yeah, I hate to say it. If you're in the business of e-commerce platforms, it's yeah. great. Yeah, great for you to a certain extent. I think some people will have a hard time switching back out of e-commerce due to fear. Mm-hmm. Will stay in that channel. If you're a grocery retailer and you've not invested in owning your platform, guess what? You've accelerated someone else yep. owning the relationship. Yeah, and that's a big concern uh, for us in Mercatus because you know we have been consistent in our messaging to the market about being honest with the retailer as to what is really happening in that shopping relationship. Right, and you're right. This is this is a huge risk to that long term relationship. Yeah, an example on the Friday in three of our markets are likely having some challenge in being serviced by delivery. And we had in the space of 20 minutes, 10,000 new accounts being created. That's insane. It was ridiculous. I'm like, who are these existing customers? What's going on? Is this a bug? And it wasn't. It was literally 
10,000 people that came through coast to coast in a space of 20 minutes creating new accounts wanting to buy online. Wow. So I think if you're a retailer and you've not invested in owning the relationship and building out your platform, trust me, this is something that you need to be extremely mindful. This will be the new normal. Yeah. You know, we've had conversations identifying there are those retailers who understand Mm -hmm. where e-commerce fits strategically and those that don't. Right. This, if anything, has the attention of the Mm C-suite. There's no avoiding it at this point in time. Now's the time to actually plan and solidify that strategy. Yeah. So yesterday there was a question on LinkedIn that was, are some retailers actually, and I'm probably going to get this wrong, but are some retailers actually leaving items on their websites for Mm -hmm. sale, although they may not be carrying them in in the store? Are they doing this in a way to transition their customers from in-store to online? Right. You saw my Mm -hmm. response. I said, no, Mm -hmm. it was the quickest response. I didn't elaborate. I didn't want to elaborate. Didn't think I needed to elaborate. Let everyone else elaborate. The reality is, is that when you understand modern technology and you've used modern technology, there are some cases that some of the retail systems that are out there have no availability to present real time inventory levels at an individual store. Mm -hmm back out to a platform, back out to the website. Quite frankly, very few of, uh, of some of the retailers <clears throat> yep. that are out there yep. in the industry uh, can do that. And so we offer multiple mechanisms in our platform. That could be when you upload your data to us on a nightly basis, set your maximum minimum thresholds on an individual SKU. If you run out of a product inside of a store, you can log into your console application and delist mm-hmm. a product, mm-hmm. right? So, so we have the traditional way of doing it you know through an interface and then there's the more modern way of doing it through a data feed there's also the capability in our platform to do it through a web service right 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 Mm -hmm. but when you're overrun with so many issues in the business dealing with lack of availability inside brick and mortar labor issues the health and wellness of your employees it just it unfortunately fell off to the wayside now i'm not saying that this is something that will continue like this in in the long run but um, just understand that this is what essentially uh, transpired. So, Mark, do you know why people hoard? <laughs> Are you trying to tell me something? No, I'm not. Okay. Are, are you a hoarder, Mark? I don't think so. Okay, good. That's good I, to know. I do have a room in my house. It's kind of messy. Oh, it's not the junk room, right? Have you gone from a junk drawer to a junk room? Yeah. Oh, that's not good. Vibe. <laughs> it's the room in the house where you move. I have this move. vision now. I'm going to be rescuing you out of a, <laughs> of a home with piles of stuff everywhere this. and Aaron cats. <laughs> yeah, just a hand sticking up from this pile of paper. Cats <laughs> yeah. chewing on my your beard. Your beard all scraggly. <laughs> <laughs> an eye patch. <laughs> I don't know why I gave you an eye patch, but I'm scared of the dark. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. So yes. Yeah, so there is a room that's messy. Anyways, we're, we're getting off topic. Yeah. Yeah. So what defines a hoarder? So there's a professor here of U of T and he kind of explains it really interesting when it comes to toilet paper. So going to the bathroom is, is something vile and primal at the same time in the sense of having access to paper to curtail no but nobody can explain this to curtail it why the fascination with toilet paper well, this is not a and to curtail it gives you in a moment of stress yeah. gives you a sense of comfort that's one side of it okay the other equation is we're very perception through our eyes mm-hmm. and our emotions when we see other people in a frenzy buying mm-hmm. we just jump in and mimic guys you remember when the cabbage patch came out no, the so doll, I, the cabbage I, I patch. I have no doll. idea what you're talking about. Do you, do, come on, <laughs> you're as old as I am. <laughs> yeah, yes, I. Do you remember people fighting over? over oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah for, like God, some of these women that bought it fight, didn't have fight, kids. Fight, you know, fist fights in Kmart. <laughs> My poor Kmart. Where's Martha Stewart when you need her? <laughs> Where is Martha Stewart? She hunkered down for this. She, she's hoarding. You know, Martha. There's a book idea for you. What to do with toilet paper? <laughs> okay. There's some great crafts, right? Anyway, it's just an idea. I will. I was at Costco and I and yeah, I pulled it off the skid. Yeah, well, the yes, I bet you did. <laughs> so, in any case, let's talk about some of the questions that we got. So, this is from Raul. So, why did some retailers' website crash? Mm-hmm. So, I'll take this one. So, you know, the harsh reality becomes planning, 
infrastructure management, architecture, and having the right people that understand scalability and being able to act in a moment's notice. And also this is stuff you have to rehearse. So you just don't wake up one morning and say, I'm gonna set up a bunch of servers and I'm gonna license out a piece of technology or we're gonna build something for our business. And then suddenly, you know, you don't think of these things. You have to plan this out. There's also, you know, the difference between building and owning it yourself. Right. And then using, you know, a scalable headless commerce solution. Well, absolutely. Right, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's why you pay monthly licensing fees this, to pay an expert yes. who understands how to do this. Yeah. It's called specialization. And that's, yeah, and that's yeah. why you have, you know, an SLA mm-hmm. in case something happens. That's why you have an application support team. That's why yeah. you have an 800 number you can dial. That's why you hire these teams to worry about that while you're more worried about everything else. Right. If I could give advice, don't ever pretend you're something that you're not. Right. Be, be good at what you're good right. at, which I, is being a... A, you know, class A retailer. I don't pretend to be a lawyer. Yeah. I have access to a lawyer. I don't yeah. pretend to be an accountant. I have an accountant. Yeah. So this is from John. Why are there items for sale on the retailer's website but not available in store? We already tackled that one. Alex mm-hmm. sent a question. Why can I get a confirmed delivery time slot? Interesting. Well, that's the reality is there is not an available resource. Yeah. Same if you're doing click and collect. If you can't get access to be able to pick up your groceries between two and four, likely the time slots Mm -hmm. have been maximized. Really comes down to resource availability to be able to support that. This one's from Jack. Why are stores running out of products? Supply and demand. It's really that simple. So this one is from Cindy. Why are people hoarding toilet paper? So we talked about that, right? She said it's the least appealing bodily function. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why people are hoarding it. We talked about it. And Louise, I'm going to let you tackle this one. Is this an opportunity to build loyalty or is it too little too late? And if you don't already have a good customer experience in place. My response is absolutely. I mean, it's in situations like this where e-commerce is becoming ever more vital to the shopping experience. It's never too late, but the retailer has to be able to control that relationship. Yeah. Bring that shopper back into your business and don't outsource them. But you got to start. You have to start somewhere, right? This has been a great episode. Yeah, I've enjoyed this. Yeah, this has been I mean, this is double the time that we normally record. Well, let's look at it this way. People are at home. They have a little more time to listen, hopefully. I think they will. You know, we're, I just, you know, in this moment of time, I encourage all of you to be safe, mm-hmm. to take care of your fellow man. You know, we don't know how long this is going to go. These are trying times. But I will also encourage you just pull away a little bit from the media. Stick to those critical news sources that will provide value to you. And stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Mark and I will stay on top of this subject. We'll come back with a couple more podcasts. And we encourage you, if you have any questions for us, Go ahead. You can visit you know, on our website. Your website. Yep. Email mark, mark.fairhurst mm-hmm. at mercatus.com, mm-hmm. myself, uh, sylvain.perry at mercatus.com. And Mark, what's next for us? I mean, all the trade shows have been canceled. This has played havoc with what I think a lot of vendors are, are facing right now is if you're not going out and meeting your customers, how else are you going to reach them? All I can say is answer your customers' questions, provide them good guidance. Don't try to sell, just provide value. Yeah. And you know, we aim to continue doing that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, peace. peace.